So I'm Donna, and I'm really happy to, to be talking to you this evening. Um, for many years, I was a physics lecturer at Maastricht University, where I'm now responsible for staff training and development. And as a physicist, you have to measure loads of different things in the lab environment, you know. So we would measure length and speeds and time, uh, mass, acceleration, voltage, current, all of these sorts of things. And, you know, I had to get my students to do experiments where they would have to take these kinds of measurements. And you take for granted as a scientist that we have this universal understanding of measurement, right? Because if we didn't, our results wouldn't make sense anywhere else in the world. So you assume we have one system of measurement in place. But of course, we know that's not the case, right? Because we all know, I'm from the UK, you can probably tell from my accent, you probably know we use miles an hour here, we're using kilometers an hour. Um, so there are all these examples, you know, do we use kilograms, do we use stone and pounds and ounces? So we know that we don't have a coherent measurement system worldwide. Um, and why is that? And I think nothing brought that home to me more than when I moved from the UK to the Netherlands. That must be 10 years or, or, or so ago now. And, you know, it begins immediately. OK, I knew that I had to exchange my money, you know, from, from pounds to euros. And money, that's a type, you know, that's a type of measurement system, right? We're measuring wealth, for instance. And then, you know, little things like, you know, the first time I was in the Netherlands and I bought a beer and it cost me five euro. And it was a ridiculously small thing for five euros. And of course, where I come from, I'm used to having a pint. And in here in Germany, you know, you get your liters as well. So I can understand that, you you know, you've experienced this yourselves, perhaps, when you've been on holiday. Um and of course, so I moved from the UK um, to, to work in the Netherlands, and I actually live over the border now in Belgium, and we're over here in Germany as well. And you see and you notice all these little differences. Um, the first time I had to buy clothes, I had no idea what size I was. The shoe sizes were different. And last year I moved house, we had to buy a new bed, and don't even get me started on the bed sizes and me trying to stuff a Belgian pillow into a UK pillowcase and it ending up this big because it's the pillowcase is so small and I can't squeeze it in. And it's very stressful and it gets you thinking, why are there so many damn ways of measuring the same thing, right? And that's the topic that I want to talk to you guys about this evening. And I want to start in, in able to answer that question. I want to start by going back and, and asking the question, well, why do we even need to measure anything at all? And if you go back way in time and you see the first sort of measurements um, coming into existence, well, you know, there was a lot of just scientific curiosity. People were curious about the world around them and they were trying to understand the world, understand nature. So that's one of the reasons that people, civilizations started to take measurements. For instance, um, people would make observations of the position in the sun in the sky throughout the year to get an indication of time, to get an indication of the length of a year. I've actually talked about this uh, with you guys in, in a previous talk. Um, I, I often talk about the topic of time. Um, they could use the, the, the constellations in the sky to also get these accurate measurements. And the ancient Egyptians um, had a huge advantage because every year the river Nile would flood over and they built these things called Nileometers, which are a kind of a pit or a well into the ground. And they could measure the water level as the, the banks of the Nile flooded over. And this also gave them a really accurate uh, measurement of the length of the year. But it wasn't just lengths of time people were measuring. If you go back to, I think it was 240 BCE, Aristophanes, who was based in ancient Egypt, even managed to, to take a measurement or, or do a calculation of the entire circumference of the Earth. And this was in 240 BCE, he managed to do this. And he was very clever because what he noticed in ancient Egypt at a certain time of the year, the summer solstice, in the city of Syene, there was a very deep well. And he noticed that the sun was directly overhead in Syene. And it meant that the sun dropped directly into the well without there being any shadows. So in Syene, there were no shadows. But further north in the city of Alexandria, he knew on exactly the same day, there were indeed shadows. So what he did, he got 
some poor, poor fellows to march out that distance between Sayin and Alexandra, to work out the distance between those two in terms of their footsteps. These were people who were trained in order to step at very, very uh, constant pace. And he measured the angle that the shadow was in Alexandra. And from this, he could do this calculation and basically calculate uh, what the circumference of the world was. And he was incredibly accurate. This was an incredibly accurate measurement. So, you know, we've got all these early forms of measurement. And it wasn't just for scientific curiosity, because if you knew about distances, if you knew about the time of year, it would also help, it would help society in a practical way through agriculture, for instance, but you would also know when was the best time of year to set sail and you could understand a little bit more about navigation. So we start to see, you know, you have the understanding of nature, but also the application to, to daily life. Um, and then that went even further because you needed to be able to build things, for instance. So, you, you know, these ancient structures were all built using ancient measurement systems. Also, you had trade. So we all we all work at the moment and, you know, you earn money, you need to buy things, you need to buy products. And in order to be able to trade with different uh, different people or uh, within uh, the community, you also need to be able to measure your goods. So a lot of the measurement systems were actually designed with this in mind. Um, so with that, and that's why we measure. But how do we even begin to measure? Well, I want to start by asking you guys a question. And that's, I want you to take a moment to look at the room around you. So just take a look at the room around you. And I want you to think specifically, say you're on the telephone to somebody and you had to describe how large the room is that you're sat in. You have to describe it, but you're not allowed to use a measurement system like a ruler or a tape measure to do that. You have to, so you have to be imaginative and describe the, the dimensions of the room to somebody. So have a little think about how, what you would do there. Now, who of you came up with, oh, maybe I would walk and put my feet, you know, side to side next to each other. And if I paced my feet out, I could say how many steps the length of the room is, right? Something like that. Or if it's a big room, I could lie down and I could see how many of my lengths the room is, something like that. What about, um, you could kind of use time and counting, right? I could say it takes me one and two and three and four count to get from one side of the room to the other. Uh, or if it's somebody that I know well and we have something in common, I could say, hey, you play squash, I play squash. It's about the size of a squash court, I could say, right? So there are all of these different ways that you can start to measure and all of them come back to making comparisons. We're always making comparisons with the world around us in order to develop a measurement system. So I said, you know, we could use the length of our feet and we could step across, we could try and count the time uh, or, or we could use something that we know. So we're always making comparisons. Um, so the earliest measurement systems actually came from something that everybody had access to at the time, and that was grains, grains of wheat or barley corn. You often see if you delve back into the history of measurement, barley corns were one of the first ever units of measurement. So if we want to measure short lengths, you can use a barley corn. If you want to go a little bit smaller, actually, one barley corn was defined as four poppy seeds. So you can see how the measurements are uh, 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 increasing. If I now put three barley corns together, I get an inch. So this is the beginning of very small length measurements. And this you see used in many, many ancient civilizations. Barley corns, oh, I should say, barley corns uh, were also used to, uh, to um, come up with um, shoe sizes. So UK shoe sizes are actually still measured using the unit of barley corn. So in Europe, in mainland Europe, it was changed because uh, French cobblers introduced their own system and that was taken over in mainland Europe. But in the UK, um, your shoe size is actually the length of your foot in barley corns minus 23. Because when you minus the 23, that was, that was like the, the size zero, that's what it started at. So we still have a hangover of these measurements in our current systems. So barley corns weren't just used for lengths, they were also used for weights and volumes. 
So if you want to weigh something in terms of barley corns, that becomes really inconvenient when you want to measure heavy things. And this is where we see stones and pounds being introduced, because basically you could use a stone to represent however many barley corns. You could use weights uh, to, to represent many bar barley corns as well. Uh, in fact, the, the, where we get the word pounds from is uh, from pondo, and that's the uh, Roman or the Latin word for weight. Um, and then if you go smaller, well, the word ounce comes from the word 12th part, and that's why one ounce is, is a 12th of a pound. So you can see barley corns being used for weights. The way that they were used for volumes is kind of confusing because they said, okay, uh, we are going to define one gallon as the volume taken up by eight pounds of substance. So that was one of the ancient definitions of a gallon, but it's just eight pounds of a substance. That's really strange because what you've created is you've created um, a volume that changes depending on what it is that you are storing. So, you know, you can have a dry gallon. So you could have a gallon of barley corns, a gallon of wheat. And, you know, that's going to be huge, right? Because it's very, it's very light. It's, it's not very dense. Whereas a gallon of wine or a gallon of ale is then going to take up much less volume because it's so heavy. So there were different gallons depending on what you wanted to, to actually store. And a pint uh, was an eighth of a gallon. This gets even more confusing because not only do we have a dry gallon that's massive uh, and then liquid gallons that's smaller, but later on, um, different countries, different areas tried to standardize their measurements. So what you had in the US was in the US, they decided to say, OK, our liquid gallon is going to be based on eight pounds of wine. So that's the US gallon. Whereas in Britain at the time, they were trying to adopt more decimalization. So they said, oh no, you know what? We're gonna call our liquid gallon 10 pounds of ale. And that's why uh, a British gallon and a US gallon are actually different. But one pint is always an eighth of a gallon, which is why a pint in England is different to a pint in America. So is that you can see that is it, all these very confusing systems arising. So I've talked about small things, I've talked about them, weights and volumes. If you wanna go on to measuring medium things, this is when you can start using your body parts, right? I can use the length of my hand or my hand span, the length of my foot, um, the, the length of my, my forearm, uh, we know is a cubit, you've probably heard of cubits, Egyptian cubits. Um, and then a yard is normally from your chest out, so it's your arm span uh, to the tips of your fingers. And then if you want to switch between those systems, you can go, OK, well, we know that a foot we can measure a medium length, um, but a foot we can also divide into 12 inches. And the word again, inch, comes from this, uh, the same word as ounce that means to mean a 12. And we've already talked about one inch is three barley corns. So you can start comparing these small units, to these big ones. And of course, a foot, you get three feet in a yard. So, you know, you can start seeing how all these systems might match together. What if we want to go longer? Well, if we want to go longer, um, I'm going to start by talking about the Roman mile. Now, Romans, that's uh, the Roman Empire, you know, it was, that period was all about conquest. It was about armies expanding the empire. So the Roman mile was all, it was defined as armies pacing, right? So these long distances were all done in terms of paces that armies were making. But strangely enough, paces, one pace was defined as two steps. Uh, and one Roman mile was a thousand paces. And they would put markers along the, the roads that they, were, that they were walking along to give them an indication of uh, distance traveled. So you can see we've got longer lengths now that we're starting to use in terms of, I, I guess you could say human productivity, because this is about you know our walking ability um and this you know you get other sorts of measurements right so um one league is defined as uh, the the distance that you could walk in an hour one acre is the amount of uh, land that one person with a team of oxen that's two oxen uh, could plow in a day 
So this is where all of these large measurement systems come into place. And you can see this is all about productivity, right? This is about how much can I do as an individual? And of course, you're going to get a lot of variation uh, occurring in this. But it's about productivity. And you even see this. Um, I gave a talk on the measurement of time for you. And uh, you can see this in time measurement systems as well, because the early devices for measuring time didn't actually split the day into hours originally. They were just, so the first ever measurement system to measure time was known as the Egyptian shadow stick. And that's what I'm drawing here. And it just gave you um, an indication of the passing of the day, the daylight, because it would measure the length of the shadow and you would know uh, how much proportion of the day that you had left. I mean, that's why we talk about time. We talk about the length of time because we use these, um, we were measuring the length of the shadow in order to understand time. And um, we, you know, it was the ancient Egyptians who first decided to split the day, uh, the daylight into 12 parts. And if you split the daylight into 12 parts, then you know that in the summer you have much more daylight than in the winter. So actually your hours were longer in the summer than in the winter. Uh, we had these unequal hours and, uh, and that was just normal because people didn't care about exact times. They just wanted to know what proportion of the daylight was there so that they could be productive. So it was all about productivity, these types of measurements. It wasn't until much later that we designed mechanical clocks and, and hours became equal throughout the year. Um, and that's also where we get the expression o'clock from, seven o'clock, where we use that because are we talking about the time on a sundial or are we talking about the time on a clock? They're not the same as each other. So you can see from that brief overview, and I could have talked about loads and loads more uh, different um, types of measurement systems, right? But from the few that I've introduced already, you can see, well, this is kind of chaotic. You've got so many different systems. They kind of relate to each other, but then you've got different numbers. You've got, oh, like, you know, eight pints in a gallon, and then you've got three inches or three sorry three feet in a, in a yard and then you've got 12 inches in a in a foot like you know it's, it's very confusing you know there aren't standard numbers involved so you might think well how did civilization survive but it worked right i mean they were able like ancient civilizations were able to build incredibly good structures uh, and you know survive with these kinds of measurement systems because as long as you had an agreement locally on your measurement system, that was good enough to function. It was that local agreed understanding of what it was you were measuring. Um, it, you know, the, the only issues that started to arise was fairness, because you've got people really trying to cheat the system. So where, you know, you might have traders that decide to use their own types of weights. Um, and it was very difficult for a fair system to arise when everybody's using their own systems of measurement, right? You don't have a common language. The other issue is we can't always trust our senses, right? So even if we did want to be fair, how do we know that we're fair without measuring something? So if I ask you guys to look at this image and I say, right, OK, I want to know. Uh, so you've got two uh, orange circles here. Which one is bigger, the one on the left or the one on the right? Well, actually, yeah, a lot of you are saying the one on the right, but these are exactly the same size and it's an optical illusion. So this is the thing, we can't always trust our senses. So this is why we have an expression in Dutch and I think you might have it in German as, as well, meter is beter, so to measure is to know. And that's why we need to be able to measure things. So you can see that this is the reason why um, there were attempts at standardization. So um, Egypt had, uh, it had a standard qubit, the pharaoh's qubit. Um, so they standardized this and they made rods, of a qubit rods, rods that they would distribute amongst society um, so that everybody had this shared understanding. In, uh, in England as well, um, yeah, uh, Henry I brought in uh, a standard measure for the yard. He said, the yard from now on is going to be the length of the tip of my nose down to the tip of my finger, and that will be a yard. And even in the Magna Carta, they, they were really striving to have one unit of measurement throughout the realm, one unit for length, one unit for wine, for instance, one unit for grain, so that there was agreement. But this was really difficult because not everybody had access 
to the king's yard. So they made prototypes and then they gave them out, but not everybody had access to that. Um, and also what you found was it was kind of done at the ruler's whim because every time another king came along, well, I want the yard to be defined after me. So there were so many changes all of the time that the, the, you know, the, the system was really failing. So, okay, so I'm gonna give you some examples of standardization. So we talked about the Roman mile already, and it was originally by the Romans defined as, we have two steps in one pace, a thousand paces is a Roman mile. Later on, around the first century, or coming up to the first century BCE, they said, okay, well, this is, is non-standard, right? How can we determine what a step or a pace is? So they standardized it and they said, okay, one pace, is actually going to be equivalent to five feet, and we standardize the foot. And that gave one Roman mile as 5,000 feet. That's great. However, other civilizations, so other, um, other societies, European societies were very agricultural. So Roman empire was all about conquest, right? But in normal European society and, and for the common man, it was all about agriculture. So for them, it was very, this, this measurement of an acre that we talked about earlier was really important to them. So an acre was the amount of land that you could plow by, uh, in one day if you had a team of oxen. And the length of the area of an uh, acre was known as a furlong. So in agricultural society, they preferred to define the mile in terms of furlongs. So they defined their mile as being eight furlongs long. And one furlong is 660 feet. So the international mile, which is what this one is known as now, is longer than the Roman mile. And it gets even more confusing because those involved in navigation, those traveling across the world, weren't so interested in that. They would take their, um, they would take their measurements of their position according to the, something landmark in the sky, for instance. So, you know, looking at the position of the North, uh, the North Star. So they're looking at angles of, um, in, in the sky to work out how far they've traveled, for instance. Um, so actually the nautical mile is then defined as um, the area, so the area, uh, sorry, it's the length that you sweep out if you have traveled one sixtieth of a, a degree across um, the, the surface of the globe. And so you've got this Roman mile, international mile, nautical mile. I mean, I haven't even mentioned the Chinese mile, the Indian mile, they were all different. So this is one of the problems you, you had different systems, um, basically what was more convenient and what were the priorities for that group of people at the time. So, you know, for, uh, come back to uh, attempts at standardization. I'm gonna now move through to revolutionary France. And this was also a society in which there were a huge number of different, um, uh, different measurement systems. So prior to uh, the revolution, they were a quarter of a million different measures, right? And it, basically even they called something the same measure, but it was it defined differently in different towns, different cities. Um, and what this allowed was it allowed people to manipulate the system. And it was a bit chaotic if you wanted to travel within the country and, and trade with other people. So, you know, it was also very difficult for scientists because, um, you know, this is the age of enlightenment and scientists wanted to be able to share knowledge, uh, share knowledge across the world. So there were, you know, with the upheaval of, um, of the feudal system in France, they decided, OK, we want to have one measure one measure for all, uh, based on nature, for all people and for all time. So they wanted to come up with new measurement systems, uh, which would be based on the natural world and, you know, weren't imposed by the rulers uh, and were accessible to everybody. So uh, I'm going to talk about some of the standardizations that they brought in. So one of the ones was time. Now we know that we define time. We have seven days in a week, 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. I mean, where do these come from? I mean, the, these are arbitrarily chosen. Uh, there was a great influence um, in this. And this is, as I said earlier, this is a, a different talk that I give. Um, there was a great influence uh, from astro astronomers. So civilizations such as the Babylonians were, um, they were keen astronomers. They did a lot of observation of the sky. And when you look at the sky and, and you look at the, the, the sphere, the celestial sphere around us, um, if you want to be able to make divisions 
without using complicated maths and fractions, then actually using a, a number such as 360 or 60, is that they're divisible by very many factors without having to use fractions. So that makes them very mathematically convenient. So a lot of the numbers that were involved in our time system uh, came from these uh, astronomical ideas. But scientists wanted to move towards a decimal system. So the system that we use today, where we count in tens and hundreds and thousands, because mathematically that's also really convenient. So there was this attempt to uh, change time into a decimal system. So the French for 13 years tried to implement a decimalized time system. So where one week was 10 days, one day was 10 hours, one hour was 100 minutes, and one minute was 100 seconds. And you can still find examples of clocks and watches that were made uh, in this decimal system. Um, but, you know, it's really, 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 really difficult to, to implement such, um, such a huge change to a system that we're all used to using. So this didn't go down uh, very well. And uh, after 13 years, it was completely scrapped. But the other measurement systems were a lot more successful. So they brought in new uh, measurement um, definitions for area. So one air, you've probably not heard of airs, but we still use hectares. So we still talk about hectares. Um, volume, um, so yeah, they talked about volumes of firewood, but also volumes of liquid, so volumes of water, so they brought in the litre, which we still use today, uh, mass being one gram, uh, which is the one cubic centimetre of water. So this measurement is also in use today. But you can see from these definitions, all of these definitions uh, have got metre in there somewhere. Right. So they all require a clear definition of the meter. So that's one of the things that they had to determine. So they said, OK, well, how are we going to define the meter? And one idea was to use a pendulum, because if you swing a pendulum, if you, if you let it go, not throw it, but if you let it go naturally, um, the period in which it goes uh, from one side and back again is fixed by uh, this equation here shows you you've got a, an L in the equation. It's fixed by the length of the pendulum. So they said, OK, one idea could be that we would define the meter as being the length of a pendulum that takes exactly one second to go from one side and back again. That could be our measurement. However, in this equation here, you also have G, and that is the acceleration due to gravity. And what they already knew is that the Earth is not actually perfectly spherical. So uh, it's wider at the equator, and that has a, an influence on this uh, acceleration due to gravity. So it means that this measurement wouldn't be the same all around the Earth. And you also get, um, you also get a difference um, depending on the land masses. So if you end up in a, a very dense environment, then that also has an effect. So what they said was, OK, we won't use the pendulum. What we will do is we will define the meter as one fourth of the meridian divided by 10 million. So what does that mean? Well, that means that you take a quarter of the circumference of the Earth, so just a quarter of it, which you can see drawn out here, and you say that that is equal to 10 million meters. That's how you define the meter. So one ten millionth of the distance between the North Pole and the equator, specifically through Paris, because this was part of the French Revolution. If you do that, you can even define angles differently. So they did that as well. We know that this is a right angle, and we have four right angles. And what they said was, instead of a right angle being 90 degrees, a right angle would be 100 gradients. If you do this, it's really cool because um, what you get is on the Earth's surface, an arc of one centigradian is equal to one kilometer. So basically, if you have a hundredth of a gradient, you have mapped out uh, one kilometer on the surface of the Earth. So that could be quite useful. Anyway. How did they actually measure this length on, on the surface of the Earth? Well, this was, um, this was a six year expedition where two men uh, called uh, Machan and uh, Delambre, they were sent out to actually measure this distance. They were going to measure a proportion of the distance and then they were gonna calculate uh, how, uh, how, um, uh, how, what the length was of this meter. Okay, so uh, what they did, they went, OK, we're going to map out the distance between um, it was a belfry in Dunkirk and a church tower in Barcelona. 
And this took them uh, well over six years. And it's, you know, they, they didn't just take this measurement. What they had to do was to use triangulation, right? So that means you stand at one point and you look at another point, so a landmark, right? And you measure that distance between those two points. Then when you stand on top of those two points, you measure the angle to the third point of the triangle that you can see here. And once you know the angle, you can calculate those distances. So you know everything. You know the angles and you know the distances. And you keep doing this all across until you can then calculate the whole length of what it was you were trying to measure. And this wasn't simple because you didn't always have landmarks. So they would have to build base stations in order to take this uh, measurement. And you can see here, this is a map of the distance that they managed to measure. It was, uh, I think it was over, uh, let me see, 1000 kilometers that they managed to measure in total. Um, and this was a time, this was post-revolution, um, post right? So they were often under siege. There was a lot of distrust in authority at the time and these people with their weird scientific instruments. So they were constantly being interrupted. They were even imprisoned. Uh, they got sick. You know, it was, it was a horrendous undertaking. And Machan actually died of yellow fever many years later when he went out on an expedition to try and improve his results. So yeah, you can see these original maps of the area that they triangulated. Anyway, they managed to get their measurement and it was, uh, it was good, but it was actually uh, 0.02% too short. Um, and the reason why is because our earth is not actually uh, perfect in shape. So they knew, they knew that it was fatter in the middle than it was at the top, but they didn't know uh, just how irregular that is. And, but when you think about the measurements that we're taking, that is still really impressive how they, uh, how they managed to do that. So that's why uh, today uh, the polar circumference of the Earth is actually 4,008 kilometers in total, uh, rather than the 40,000 that they, uh, sorry, 40,008 kilometers in total, rather than the 40,000 that it was supposed to be defined as. Um, so now we have this reproducible, reliable, fair and equal system, right? It doesn't depend on rulers. It doesn't depend on all of these things that could vary, like the time it takes for me to plow a field. Um, or, or do we? Well, actually, these new developments, these, these new measurements from the French Revolution were still um, defined on the Earth and the properties of water, which we know change under different uh, atmospheric pressures and temperatures. So since then, there have still been more and more developments to try and make these measurements more accurate. So in this, uh, in this circle here, you can see uh, we have different types of measurement units around the outside. So S is for seconds, M is for meter, here kilograms, uh, here A for amps for the current. And what we do now is instead of using um, these, these things in nature that could change, we try and define these things by constants in nature. So the constants are on the middle of the circle here. You can see C is the speed of light in a vacuum. E is the charge on an electron. So I'll just go through a few more examples. Um, so for instance, um, a second was always defined as uh, the length of a solar day divided by 24 hours, divided by 60 minutes, divided by 60 seconds. That gives you the length of a second. However, for reasons I won't go into uh, right now, but uh, the, the length of a solar day varies throughout the year. It varies because we have a tilt on our axis and, and because we, uh, we orbit in an, an eclipse, um, sorry, in, a, in an eclipse rather than, um, in an ellipse, sorry, rather than a circle. Um, so the question is, if you have to take an average, where do you take the average over? So this is, this is something that, that um, uh, contributed to uncertainty in the measurement. So what they did in the 60s is they decided, OK, um, we uh, can actually redefine the length of a second and we will use um, uh, an energy transition of a cesium atom uh, in order to, to do that. That's because if you take it was it was noticed that if you took cesium atom, it has electrons around it. And um, if you expose it to uh, radiation, the electrons will absorb that energy. And that is a, a very, very uh, fixed frequency uh, of energy that that takes uh, that, that, that takes place. So that was being able to redefine something based on something in nature that never, ever changes. Similarly, 
is very interesting because we defined a mass related to a cubic centimeter of water. And then what they did was they made prototypes of one kilogram. So they had these one kilogram standards all over the world that were used in order to define what is a kilogram. But in, you know, over many, many years, it was found that all of the prototypes, the, the masses were starting to deviate from each other, you know, partly due to just aging or due to exposure to air, due to the cleaning process, due to the weighing process, all of these things were having an impact. So they had to redefine that. And what they built, this is a, a picture of it, and it's very difficult to see what it is from the picture, but it's a type of balance, kibble balance. And what they did was they were able to, um, you know, like an electromagnet, if you, turn, if you use current, you can create a magnetic field. So they would use a current to create a magnetic field that would balance the weight of the one kilogram on the other side. So you were able to define your weight in terms of uh, electrical properties, essentially. So that's how we now define a kilogram. And light um, is used to define uh, the meter because we know that the speed of light in a vacuum is always the same. That's a universal constant. So now we define a meter dependent on how we measure the speed of light. Uh, and we use all sorts of mirrors. I remember doing this experiment when I was at university. It was an absolute pain to set up. You had to set it up so perfectly. Basically, you measure the interference in light. You get these, um, you get these um, fringes. So different, um, so black, white, black, white, where there is light and no light. And you can use that um, in order to measure uh, the speed of light and therefore define your meter. But at the end of the day, we are still making comparisons with the world around us, right? Because even though we have a better, more rigorous and, and, and reliable measurement system, we're still making comparisons with the world around us. You know, so we're still going, oh, yeah, let's compare everything. To, we'll compare it to the speed of light, et cetera. Um, so do we have a, a reproducible, reliable, fair and equal system that can be uh, used universally? Well, it's still not universal though, right? I mean, so a couple of the examples that uh, you know, I can uh, talk about, are, um, it, for instance, there was um, an Air Canada flight. It was traveling between Montreal and Edmonton and it ran out of fuel at 41,000 feet. Yes, they, they still use feet in the aviation industry. Um, but they managed to do a successful emergency landing. There were no injuries, but you know, this, 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 could have, this, I mean, this is really serious, but it's because the, um, the, they'd done a miscalculation in the amount of fuel that was needed. So uh, in pounds per liter instead. And in 1999, there was also a case uh, of a Korean airplane crashing because they had misread the altitude. Um, and then another very, very famous example is uh, the NASA Mars Climate Orbiter. After, I think it was uh, a year trying to get to Mars, um, it actually crashed into the surface of Mars. Um, and that's because NASA were using metric units, whereas Lockheed Martin were using US customary units and they'd actually uh, calculated the trajectory incorrectly. Um, and this, was, this, this cost them more than $300 million. So I guess one of the questions is, you know, why haven't the US actually adopted um, these universal systems that we use in most places in the world now? And that's a very complicated and very political question, right? Uh, there, are, there are actually many different reasons for it. You know, you could say some of it is down to national pride, especially because there was a big push to try and introduce metric, for instance, in the UK in the 70s, but in the US, you know, it was um, post-Vietnam and there was a lot of um, frustration about how things went in Vietnam and they thought, okay, well, we don't want to be seen to losing Vietnam. And now we're going to take on these European ideas. Um, no, we, we have our national pride to think about, you know, so, so that these kind of things um, uh, came into play as well. Um, but also, you know, if you look at local companies, say if you're a milk farmer, What's the incentive for you to, to you know, start bringing in new measures? Because you're not trading internationally. So if you're a local company and you're trading only within your country, then also there's no, there's no motivation to, to engage in, in those uh, new units. 
Uh, you can also say that like tooling would cost a lot of money. So if you've got all the, the industry that you have, and you, go, you have to retool, you have to use all of these tools that are now going to be on the metric system. Um, it would cost a, an unbelievable amount in order to make those changes. And some people even say, OK, these US customary units actually make more sense because if I'm a baker and uh, I measure something in twelfths, it's very easy to divide in half, divide in half, divide in half again. That's easier than having a system that's decimal where I would have to only divide by tens. So, you know, and also people say, oh, yeah, it's intuitive because an inch is sort of the, the, the width of my thumb and a foot is kind of the length of my foot. So it's more intuitive. So there are all these arguments that could be made. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's not fully adopted. But I've also got to say, actually, scientists in the US are using metric units and um, maybe not everybody in the US knows, but even since the late 1890s, um, actually all US customary units have officially been um, defined using met the metric system. So here you can see there's actually a table that you can download from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They're responsible for all uh, the measure, measures that are in place. And you can download an entire book that, that basically translates all of the US customary units in use to the metric system. So uh, what's underlying their system is our metric system, even if on the work floor, they don't actually uh, always know that. So that's it, right? We now have this reproducible, reliable, fair, equal system that is actually being used universally, even if they don't know it or admit it. Or is it? Well, actually, there's just one last thing that I would like to talk about before I wrap up in the next 10 minutes. And that's, okay, we've gone from this system where we used to use ourselves to measure the world. We used to say, I'm gonna measure something in terms of my hand or my arm length. Well, now we've developed these really perfect, reliable, equal, fair systems. Now we're using those to measure ourselves. So what do I mean by this? Well, you know, I talked about earlier how the seconds used to be defined and it used to be defined by taking these average solar days and doing this division. And taking averages is something that scientists do all of the time because we know one measurement isn't always the truth. It's not always reliable. So we take many, 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 many measurements and we take an average to get a more accurate understanding of the world. And astronomers do this. And the guys who set out my expedition to measure the circumference of the Earth or, or the, the distance between Barcelona and Dunkirk, they also they had these uh, measurement uh, instruments where they could take many, many, many uh, measurements of the angle and work out the averages and get a better accurate result. So, you know, that, that's great, right? It means that we're getting more accuracy, more reliability. But uh, I want to tell you about an interesting story, and that's um, this. Uh, it was a Belgian astronomer. His name was Adolf Ketelet. And he was the one who, in Brussels, he said, he, he managed to uh, build the uh, Brussels Observatory. He managed to say to the governors, I want some money for this, and they funded his project. However, then the Belgian Revolution broke out, and it was chaos in the streets, and he wasn't able to use his amazing observatory for his astronomy. But he wasn't a man to sit around and do nothing. So he thought, well, if I can't measure the sky and if I can't measure the stars, what can I measure? Well, like I said, it's a revolutionary period in Belgium, and or what was to become Belgium. And what they what he realized was the world is in chaos and I don't understand why are people so unpredictable and why do they act in this way? And he started measuring people. For the first time, he decided to start using big data and statistics. With statistics, we all learn at school statistics, right? So we feel like it's been around since the beginning of time. But he was the first person to really start analyzing statistics. So this was the period where he started getting big censuses. And he had all sorts of data uh, about births, deaths, crimes, diseases, age of marriage, suicide rates. Um, and what he decided to do was take the techniques that were only used by scientists in astronomy at the time and use them on people and society. 
So one of the things that he did is he took the measurements of 6,000, almost 6,000 Scottish soldiers, and he worked out all the averages. He worked out the average weight, the average height, all of these kind of things, average health statistics. Um, and it's actually from him that we uh, get this body mass index that we still use today, right? And what he thought was, okay, you have an average and the average of the population represents perfection and everything else is an error. So we should be striving like for this, this perfect or this average. Um, and this idea was really taken off and it was actually really useful because this was all, also the period where uh, you had the civil war in the US. And uh, you had loads and loads of soldiers and they needed to be fed and they needed to be clothed. So actually Abraham Lincoln took on his ideas and he said, right, we're going to do an analysis of all of our soldiers so that we can standardize the food that we send out. We can standardize clothing. And in fact, this is where we first got, well, they were producing uniforms and they didn't want to custom make every uniform anymore. So this is where we got all of our sizes, small, medium and large, for instance. Um, so, you know, you think, oh, that was a really good thing that we could start using these averages and standardizing. But actually, then it's more interesting because about 100 years later, during the Second World War, all of a sudden the US had to recruit a lot more pilots. The Air Force were recruiting way more pilots than they had ever before. And they were getting a huge number of fatal accidents, not only uh, in combat, but in training, huge, huge uh, problems with training accidents. And there was a guy who was brought in, his name was uh, Gilbert Daniels, who was brought into the Air Force to try and work out uh, and analyze why are these accidents taking place. And it turned out, you know, it turned out that well, in those days, cockpits were designed for the average pilot. So there was, you know, in order to, so like our clothes, a medium, right? So everything was a medium cockpit. So everything was set for the average. Now, what this guy Daniels found out, he measured 4,000 pilots on 140 dimensions, right? Those dimensions, it could be the length of your thumb, it could be the height of your crotch, it could be the distance between your nose and your ear, for instance. Then what he did was he chose 10 of those dimensions, maybe the most important ones, you know, your height, your arm length, your leg length, uh, the distance between your eyes or something. And he decided on those 10 dimensions, how many of those 4,000 pilots matched all 10? How many of those 4,000 pilots were average on those 10 dimensions? I don't know if uh, you can uh, have a guess. Actually, it was zero. Zero out of 4,000 pilots were average on 10 dimensions. So he said, okay, then what about just on three dimensions? How many of those people were average on just three dimensions? Less than 3.5%. So there's no such thing as average. And that is why they were having so many problems with people. They, they, you know, it wasn't designed for them. It was designed for an average person and there's no such thing as average. And this is now something we take for granted because they read the Air Force invested in redesigning all of their planes so that everything was adjustable. And that's what we're used to in society today, right? We're used to getting in the car and being able to move the seat forwards and backwards, for instance. We're used to being able to, to, to strap things and have uniforms that are different sizes. Um, so actually, like being able to take individuality into account is incredibly important and not just measuring ourselves by averages. So, you know, that's great in some cases, but it's not always the case because in, in education, in the workplace, averages are often still used in order to make judgments on people. So education is designed to deliver to the average student. Schedules are all the same, right? So if you're teaching uh, one course on one topic or one course on another, the, the length of the lessons are all the same. Uh, you can only graduate if you've sat in a class for three years. Even if you're the best student, no, you still have to do three years. You, there's no fast tracking. Um, and it's the same, you know, you apply for a job. And a lot of people, you know, they're interested, do you have this qualification? What was your score in high school? Um, if you go to the doctors, you know, you're often treated like a statistic. Oh, you have pain there because, oh, yeah, if I look, oh, the majority of people, yeah, if they have pain there, it's this. But actually, that might not be the case because you are not a statistic, right? You're an individual. I remember going to the physio for a problem 
uh, had an injury in my elbow and went to the physio and they gave me these exercises. And I went into the hall to do the exercises and I saw the guy next to me and he'd been given the same exercises. And uh, you're like, well, you know, I'm just being treated like a statistic. And actually these things can lead to misdiagnoses. Uh, one example is looking, um, so these are brain imaging scans that I'm showing on screen. And if you look at brain images, uh, you know, they often do these experiments where they get you to think about a certain thing. And then they can go, oh, if you were trying to mem memorize an image, I can see that um, people use a, a specific part of their brain. But those conclusions that they draw are also taking averages from a huge number of different brain scans that they've had. And they've actually found Actually, when you do that, you lose a lot of information because some people will use one part of the brain, whereas another person uses a different part of their brain. So when you average that out, you end up with false information. So this use of averages and measuring everybody by one standard can be really dangerous. Think about drug development and think about the fact that a lot of studies are performed on only white males of a certain age. So that means, you know, next time you're taking paracetamol or any drug that was developed specifically for an average of a whole bunch of 30 to 50 year old white men who were on average 70 to 90 kilograms. Am, am I that? So these are all things that, you, you know, you can uh, you can think about. Ah, And this might become more dangerous as algorithms are developed to take over the tasks of people. So there are all sorts of examples. And actually, I think, you know, this is a time to have this movement towards the, the science of the individual. Employers are starting to become more open. So there are now employers that say it doesn't matter what your qualifications are. You come and you uh, spend a day and, you know, you, you have to sit a task. And if you can do that task well, then we will welcome you with open arms because it's not about having the qualification or ticking the box or having the average score, or your GPA, your, your grade average at a certain value. It's about can you do the job? Have you got the competence? Um, it's also about, you know, having the appraisal system at work better. I know my boyfriend, he, he uh, works for a company and they went, oh, we can't give you an A this year because we're only allowed to give out five A's each year. And we gave them all out already. I mean, it's ridiculous, right, this kind of thing. So it's about people, treating people as an individual and, you know, like not just having a CV or not just having a, a qualification, but having a narrative, being able to demonstrate your skills and your ability, your individuality through a narrative and through a story and not just through averaging numbers. So I guess I wanted to end. Uh, so there's a very interesting book that you can read on the topic, but uh, and I'll show you some more of those. But I wanted to end by saying, don't forget, we are still measuring by making comparisons with the world around us. We're making better and more reliable comparisons. But at the end of the day, all of our measurement systems, they're man-made. We have decided how to define our measurement systems. So don't always measure yourself by someone else's yardstick. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I can also, I'll put up some uh, a list of uh, books that you might find interesting if you want to read more about the topic. And with that, I'll say thank you and uh, I'll open the floor to questions.